computer. So we can use this again for YouTube later. So Sean, would you like me to just start admitting everyone as they come in or do you wanna wait till bang on seven o'clock? Yeah, you might as well let them in. All right, admit all. And good to go. Everyone. I can't type in a talk at the same time. Uh, welcome everyone as you're joining. Uh, your mics should automatically be turned off as should be your cameras. Uh, that prevents you from exploding my internet. Uh, but if you do find you can do something like that, just go ahead and turn it off. Uh, and we can keep welcoming people as they come in. Uh, we are starting a little bit early just in terms of the session. Uh, we don't have an account limit, but that way we thought we could get people rolling in. Uh, although you can't speak to me directly, uh, you should be able to message in the chat. Uh, I have participants. So chat to everyone. There you go. Uh, for example, I just wrote, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. And if you haven't used a, a Zoom call before, uh, you really kind of look around. Uh, most of it's self-explanatory. If your mouse is hovering near the bottom of the screen, you should see a little speech bubble. That is chat. Just click on that and there you go. iPhone X's said, hi, thank you. Um, some of you may have the name of your device as opposed to your actual name, in which case iPhone X's, thank you. Uh, Sean is currently on mute, but we're gonna have him as the only camera for the main time because again, you've probably seen my face already. This presentation is about the lecturer, so I'll probably pop on at the end for a few words. 28. Um, I've been admitting people, by the way, while you pontificate. Uh, as some of you may know, I do get quite wordy and I'll sometimes get distracted. Okay, good stuff. Um, I'll say, we'll, Sean, we won't start until, of course, exactly seven, but did you want to start at seven? Or do you want to wait till we get a majority? helps if I unmute myself. Uh, we'll start at seven. If we still see that there's some people coming in, maybe hang off for a minute or two. We'll really play it by ear. We'll be fluid. All right, someone all the way from California. That's always good. So it appears I can turn people's uh, mics off, um, but it appears I cannot turn off your webcams. Um, so if you do notice that you are streaming your webcam, it's not a huge imposition, but uh, if you feel like it's gonna, uh, you might be showing more than you need to show, by all means, just check yourself. Uh, this will be recorded and put on YouTube uh, and on Facebook. And so we wanna make sure if you are putting yourself on the webcam, you will be, I won't say YouTube famous, uh, but certainly YouTube somewhat out there. <laughs> so this act is a discretionary warning that you are signing a non-disclosure, et cetera, et cetera. All right, Don and Pat Glasgow have no audio from us. We hear you fine. Delta BC, that's BC. few people contact me through other mediums. Ali is yelling from the other room, British Columbia, Matthew. Ah, thank you. I am always happy to, I mean, that's why we attend lectures, right? We attend to learn things that apparently um, everyone should already know. <laughs> Ohio's, all right, this is wonderful. This is a really nice mix. Um, I'll just what, do one more blurb while I wait for the last two minutes. Of course, the Konica Jig Institute uh, is in Welsh Run, Mercersburg, Franklin County, Pennsylvania. So to see all of these out of staters and oh, uh, yeah, of course, out of country of uh, Canada, um, that's wonderful. That definitely shows the improvements that uh, virtual can give us. Uh, 
Um, so on your right hand side, again, if you're not used to Zoom, uh, where you're seeing cameras, you should see a few little options, grid view, show thumbnail video, small active speaker. Uh, during the actual presentation itself, I would recommend just going to small active speaker. Uh, that way it will focus on Sean and his presentation and you won't see other people's reactions. Two more messages. Down. Sean sounds fine, but Matthew sounds muffled. It's very plausible. Uh, Sean has professional headphones and mic on and I'm speaking for a webcam, which is why for the entire hour of the presentation, I'll be muting my camera entirely. And with that, it is seven o'clock. Um, so again, I have introduced myself, Matthew Wedd, the Conic Jig Institute. We'll talk more at the end, um, but you came to see a presentation by someone who had planned it well, uh, played in Pennsylvania by Sean Considine. So I'll f follow the chats, but now I'm going to unmute myself. Good luck and have fun. Hi, everyone. This is uh, Sean Considine. Matthew, you'll keep admitting people. It seems like there's some folks coming in. I have the participant thing up and I'll keep it up. So, yes. Aces. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming in or maybe afternoon, depending on what time it is. Uh, we applied in Pennsylvania or played in Pennsylvania, if you want to say it with the correct 18th century pronunciation. Uh, this really started as a side project for Matthew and the results on it were just pretty interesting. Um, doing some research that I, I started writing them down, sharing it with Matthew, and it's just kind of turned into this thing. And now we're here sharing it with you. Uh, so really the thing that started this was looking at who was settling in Welsh Run and in our area of um, Pennsylvania, where the Conica jig is. And, you know, we knew that there were some Ulster Scots, Scots Irish, as they're also known, um, and there were Scottish immigrants in the area. So kind of figuring out what they looked like, what they were wearing, that sort of thing kind of led to this played in Pennsylvania. And now here we are, I'm doing a Zoom meeting for 50 of my closest friends um, on the internet that I just met, early, met earlier today. Um, so bear with me. Um, let's get this thing rolling. So the objectives of tonight, um, we are here to explore those distinctive items, materials, and accoutrements of 18th century Scottish, their, their attire and their usage. Um, we're looking at extant items as much as we possibly can represent in 18th Scotch, uh, Scottish clothing. We're trying to contextualize the wearing of this as well, not just like because they felt like it, that sort of thing. You know, why are they wearing this? And you know, what's, what's a big deal? Why does Scottish clothing matter? Um, and we're also looking at the import and wear of Scottish materials, clothing and accoutrements, because you'll find things in Pennsylvania are a little bit different than they are in England. They're even a little bit different than they are elsewhere in the American colonies. Uh, and the other thing to really focus on in this presentation is that the research is continuous. This is only a small portion of the of the research. Um, I'm finding themes, we're finding things that are showing up, but we're st I'm still looking in this. Um, part of the big deal of this is we're, we're calling this played in Pennsylvania because I'm looking at played. So there are other factors that we're going to look at in terms of Scottish attire, things like blue bonnets, which I'll get into a little bit later, but we're not looking at them by themselves, they're showing up in the context of played and other uh, tartan and other textiles that are showing up. Uh, things that we're not going to do tonight is we're not going to look at original 18th century tartan and how you can date that or, you know, is, was this at the Battle of Culloden or that sort of thing. Um, tonight is about Pennsylvania. It's about the clothes that were there. It's about the Scottish materials. We're going to talk a little bit about that because you do need that background information. Uh, but sorry, that's not what we're here about. We're not looking at that sort of stuff. And you know, how, how was a kilt made in the 18th century? There's plenty of other people out there who can tell you that. I could probably tell you that, I'll tell you later, but not tonight. Um, so what are we looking at? So first and foremost, we're looking for examples of played and played related textiles and clothing. Um, we're looking at them in Pennsylvania. So as I said before, uh, we're gonna see some other pieces of Scottish attire of, Scott, of Highland um, accoutrements, things like that, that you would associate it with it, but we're primarily focused on played. We'll probably hit some more of that in future research and as we expand it even more. But right now we're looking at played and tartan textiles. We're looking at Pennsylvania from 1745 to 1785. Uh, there's a pretty good reason for that. It's relevant to a specific time in Highland wear, in Scottish attire. It's right after the final 
uh, Jacobite uprising. Um, and it's going until the, the Dress Act is, well, three years after it was repealed, and folks can actually wear Highland attire again legally within Scotland. Um, it also happens to coincide with the end of the colonies association with Great Britain. That happens in 1783 on paper, but I figured, hey, let's keep it round. Let's go to 1785 and we'll look at two extra years. So the years that we're studying has to do with twofold, again, Dress Act, which we'll get into a little bit more later, and American colonies becoming the United States. Uh, although we're focusing primarily on Pennsylvania, we are going to bring in some companion information from places like Maryland, New Jersey, and Virginia, um, trying to keep them in places that are kind of similar um, at, uh, geographically and ethnically of the people who are settling that area. And what we're looking at is we're looking at original merchant advertisements, we're looking at runaway ads, we're looking at deserter ads, we're looking at probate records, and we're looking at period images. So primarily, this is first. This is primary source based. So a little bit of background information. Um, I'm going to give you the briefest history of the Jacobites. It, I'm going to miss a lot because we're going to go pretty quickly. So Jacobites comes from the Latin form of James, which starts with James the first of James the first of England and the sixth of Scotland. Uh, he is the person who becomes king after Elizabeth, the last of the Tudors, died. He is the king of both of these countries, so he has what's called the personal union. So although they are two separate countries of English and Scotland, he rules both of them, and he really wants to unite the two of them, but it never really happens. When he dies, his son takes over. Uh, his son, Charles I, becomes king. Uh, unfortunately, his reign and his person were cut short at the end of his reign. Um, there was this big thing called the English Civil War, or the, uh, the English Revolution that occurs, and we take a break from kings in England for a little bit. We have a Lord Protector now. We got this guy named Char uh, Oliver Cromwell who ends up becoming the Lord Protector of England. When he dies though, there's a big power gap and Charles the first son, Charles the second ends up coming back. Uh, the only issue is that when Charles the second becomes king, he ends up being childless. Um, so when he dies, uh, the succession goes to his younger brother, James, who becomes James the second. And James, uh, the second, he, he kind of causes this problem because he is overtly Catholic and he starts doing, he, he starts uh, passing quite a few laws that allow Catholicism not only to exist in England, Charles II was actually trying to um, have a lot of, uh, have a, give more rights to Catholics, but James is kind of leading the country in a, in a Catholic area and they just had, you know, they had this English English Reformation a few years ago. One of the big things in the Civil War was about Protestantism, and a lot of people in England are too happy about this. So they send this invitation over to William and Orange, William of Orange, and James the Second's daughter Mary um, to come over and kind of say, "Hey, why don't you guys come over and rule?" And this thing called the Glorious Revolution of 1688 happens. Um, they end up taking over, English be England becomes a Protestant country one more, and James II ends up going over and living in France. Uh, when, William, uh, when Mary dies, William ends up taking over, he serves as king even though they were dual monarchs before, um, and a little bit before he dies they pass the Acts of Settlement, which goes, comes into effect when William dies, and it basically says if you are a Catholic, if you are married to a Catholic, if you ever thought about Catholic, if you wrote the word Catholic once when you were in third grade, you cannot be the monarch of England. So, which means, so when William dies, the power then goes to Mary's sister Anne, again, a child of James II, because she is again a Protestant. She ends up ruling for quite some time. Some good stuff happens. The Acts of Union hap uh, occur, which formally unifies England and Scotland as one country, as the United Kingdom, pretty cool. And then she dies and we have a crisis because she had no surviving children. Well, not really, because they already knew what was going on. The acts of settlement had been passed years before. They already knew who was gonna take over. And they skip down the line to this guy by the name of George, um, who happens to be a Hanoverian. Uh, George is the elector of Hanover. Um, he ends up becoming the next king of England. And then we have the Hanoverians, that the, their dynasty ends up taking over. However, James II, remember James II, he was deposed quite a long time ago. Um, had a second wife and they had a child, uh, the guy by the name of James Edward Stewart, realizing that he is closer to the line of succession than this guy, George, who's German, who is from a foreign country. He decides that, hey, I got a pretty good shot at being king. So with French support, he ends up coming over to England and he starts what's called the Jacobite Uprising, the first one in 1715. It doesn't go so well for James. 
Um, he loses he loses at the Battle of Preston Pans and is forced to leave. The picture up in the top left, by the way, that is uh, that is James II, his dad. The picture underneath of him, that is James Edward Stuart. Uh, so James Edward Stuart, he's kicked out of England. The succession crisis is pretty much solved. The Hanoverians take over. And then four years later, he says, you know what? I got friends over in, in, in Spain. Let's see if they'll help. So they have a second Jacobite uprising. Now with the Spanish, they come over and they don't, they do just about as well as they did with the French. Um, so he kicked out again and they're pretty much hangs out for a while. He doesn't try to do it again. He ends up going to Rome. Uh, but then his son, this guy by the name of Charles Edward Stuart, who's commonly referred to as Bonnie Prince Charlie or the Young Pretender in 1745, he ends up coming over uh, to do the third and final Jacobite rebellion. Uh, it goes pretty well for a while. England is fighting the War of Austrian Succession. They're, they're elsewhere. Uh, but then finally at this at this battle called Culloden that you've probably heard about outside Iver Iverness, they finally end up getting defeated soundly. Charles Edward Stuart has to evacuate the country. He hides for a while, makes it out the sky, and eventually comes back over to France and then goes to Rome. And that is the last of the Jacobite rebellions. Well, if you're the king of England, you might have had enough at this point. There's been three rebellions trying to unseat you. So after, in the 18, sorry, in the 1720s, there was this thing called the Acts of Prescription. But in 1747, additional measures are put in the Act of Prescription. It disarms the Scots. But the other thing that comes in there is this thing called the Dress Act. And this is what it says in the Dress Act, that no man or boy within the part of Great Britain called Scotland shall on any pretense whatsoever wear or put on clothes commonly called Highland clothes. That is to say, plaid, fill a bag or little kilt, trues, shoulder belts, or any part whatsoever of what particularly, but particularly belongs to the Highland garb, that no tartan or partly colored plates or stuff shall be used for great coats or for upper coats. And if any such person shall presume after the first day of August to wear or put on the aforesaid garments, any part of them, every such person offending shall suffer, and this is crazy, six months in prison for the first offense. And if you're convicted again, you get transported to the colonies for seven years. Pretty crazy. However, this act is full of holes. First of all, it only pertains to men or boys. Second of all, it only pertains when you're in Scotland. So women can wear them. Women can wear plaid. They can wear all sorts of things. You can do it outside. So you can technically do it in the American colonies. In fact, if you're caught doing it for your second offense, you're going to be shipped to the colonies. Uh, you can do it in England. In fact, there are newspaper articles of English lords, and this is being published in Philadelphia newspapers, going out on a hunting party. And it's noted that the way that you can tell the English lords of the hunting party is because they're wearing Highland plaid. So they are wearing this kind of clothes while they're hunting. Uh, they also happen to be doing it in Scotland, by the way, so they were breaking their own law. But the law has a lot of weird holes in it as well, because it's saying on any presence whatsoever shall wear or put on the clothes commonly called Highland clothes. Okay, so what does that mean? That it, So they list a couple things. The plaid, which is the great kilt. Um, the filibeg, which is a fitted small kilt. Um, and then they talk about tartan in there a little bit, but it's really not clear. It talks about great coats and for upper coats, but can you use it for breeches? Can you use it for waistcoats? Can you use it for other articles of clothing? It's not really, it's, pre it's pretty vague, but earlier it says before that you can't wear plaid at all. And that's kind of where we get into the semantics of words. So moving to the next thing. So what actually is plaid? Well, it's many things. Uh, plaid, first off, is a garment. It, the, the word actually comes from Gallic. It comes from a term that means blanket, and that's pretty much what it is. Uh, plaids, as we think of them, are what we think of as the 21st century great kilt. It's a piece of fabric. It's about three to four yards long. It is two pieces of fabric that are joined together in the center to be about 60 inches wide by about three to four yards, as I said. Um, and it looks like a very large blanket. These are worn um, on the body belted uh, where the wearer would either pleat them or can pleat them on the ground or can do it stand up. You put a belt around it, you tighten that belt. Um, the back is pleated, the front is flat, and then the rest of it hangs down. And then that hanging down bit can be brought over the body, um, can be worn in many different ways, depending on what the wearer thinks about. So it's a blanket that's being worn. That is a plaid. However, a plaid is also a fabric. So 
Florence Montgomery, who wrote this fantastic book called Textiles in America, pretty much sums up a lot of the period definitions in that it's a twil twill or plain woven cloth with a pattern of intersecting stripes, both in the warp and the weft. Um, the patterns may also be printed. So that's what we're looking at on the right side of the screen. That is what is described as a played, a tartan played. It's from a mid 18th century swatch book that exists in, in France. You can go, well, you can, it's scanned in, but it still exists. It's from a Scottish textile merchant who ended up going to France after the last Jacobite uprising. The pattern itself that we see on this is called a tartan. Now, let me back up for a second on plaids. Plaids, the fabric, do not have to have this particular pattern on them. We tend to think of them as Americans. Americans tend to think of this pattern itself, what the pattern is, is called plaid. That's what most Americans think. People would say, I'm wearing a plaid shirt because they're thinking about that pattern. But the fabric itself is that. But plaids, the fabric, don't have to have that pattern on them. Some of them are solids. In the, United, in the colonies, we find quite commonly that there are solid white and there are solid blue plaids that are typically worn by enslaved persons in this country. Um, you'll also find that stripes, striped plaids exist um, and there are other types of things. So really, at the end of it, in, this, in, the, in the colonies, it's a twilled cloth. What you need to get into is that next step is that tartan, um, or sometimes it's called a scotch plate. So tartan is the actual pattern that's in there. So from an 1800 document, we have the definition of tartan being a woolen cloth woven in squares of the most vivid colors in which green and red are prominent. Other contemporary descriptions tend to say that there are blue and there are other there are blue, other colors, there are white, but the commonality between all the period definitions of tartan is that intersecting crossbar type pattern um, of many different vivid colors. So to make this short, Plaid is a fabric, tartan is the actual pattern. So keep that in mind as we're talking about this. Remember those definitions. So Highland clothes, things that this is possibly forbidding in, in, in the, the Dress Act. Plaid, again, that great kilt. You can see up here, uh, where is my, I think my mouse died. Um, up here in the top, Grab my spotlight because I remember how to do this. Up here in this image, this man is wearing the full plaid. Uh, this is a Highland soldier from a David Allen in 1785. Uh, but you can see the pleats in the back, and then the rest of the blanket is gup and it's tucked in his in the um, epaulette right there. So that would be the plaid, that great kilt that we think about in 21st century tomb terms. The filibeg, the filibeg, also called the little kilt. Um, it is a fitted garment. So think about when you see drummers putting on, you know, drummers and pipers putting on a thing. Now they're not, they don't have this excess fabric in the back. They just have uh, the small skirt like thing. That is what they would call a filibeg in the 18th century. Constructed completely different, um, but it still exists. We're really not sure of the dating of it. It could come from the late 17th century. We know that they existed by at least about the 1730s. Uh, in the images here, these guys, these Jacobite prisoners, uh, they are they are all wearing filibags because you can see uh, that there is a plaid wrapped around them here, uh, but you don't see it coming from the back of their coats. So they are wearing a filibag there. This gentleman is wearing one as well, same similar type of thing. He has a plaid wrapped around him and then he is wearing a filibag right there. Uh, we commonly find that Scots are described as wearing plaid coats, like this one here of Earl of Dunmore. Uh, this gentleman here is wearing one as well. Uh, you also see uh, Scots hose, which again, all of these men are wearing here. You see uh, specific garters, uh, decorative garters. He is wearing them. There's decorative garters there. Uh, and then you see bonnets which this gentleman is wearing here, kind of looks like a newsboy hat. Uh, or, uh, the Earl of Dunmore is wearing one as well. There he is wearing a bonnet up here. It's a different type of hat as opposed to a cocked hat that you would see an Englishman wearing. They are knit. Uh, thing about bonnets is that they are worn forward on the head. They're not pulled back like a beret, like you see in um, some historic fiction shows, Outlander. Um, but they are worn forward. They look more like a newsboy, a newsman hat than a, a beret. And the one thing I skipped here, because we'll see it on the next slide, is trues, um, which are very much like medieval. Um, they're very much like medieval um, 
pose um, to the fact that we'll I'll just show you on the next slide because they're pretty interesting. Oh, gotta take off that. There we go. Um, so the trues are all the way on the right in this image. So they are cut very tight to the skin. They are cut on a bias to allow it to have more stretch, which is why instead of having that upright uh, looking plate, they're shifted over to the side. Um, and the other cool thing that gives you the fact that they're related to medieval hose is they actually have a piece that goes over top of the foot. So they kind of look like footy pajamas, but they go into the, they actually will go into the shoe. So they are both your stocking and they are your, your leg covering. So here we are looking at some original garments um, on the left. That is a Highland jacket that's in the Glasgow Museum. It's believed to have been present at the, the story goes that it was present at the Battle of Culloden, not verified. Uh, the next coat is one that, again, was supposed to be associated with the Third Jacobite Uprising. It is said to have been uh, owned by Bonnie Prince Charlie himself. Uh, it is silk, so it is silk played, uh, woven like that, and then it is adorned with velvet on the sleeves and on the lapels and the collar. Uh, up at the top, this is a silk wrapping gown that's in the Colonial Williamsburg's collection. Uh, again, it's in a played pattern, but it isn't silk. Um, and then on the right, as I stated, this is Sir John Hyde Cotton's um, Highland suit that he had made before uh, Charles Edward Stuart landed in England. Um, so 1744 was a very important date. So that way he wasn't associated with, hey, I'm, I'm not one of those Jacobites that's rebelling against the king. But that is a surviving example of truth. And there was a pretty good academic piece that's been written on that, mapping out the pattern of it. Uh, Highland clothes for women. The first thing they have is the Arised. Um Earlier 16th, sorry, 17th century descriptions of it kind of have a lot like the belted plaid, with the exception that it's not being pleated. So it's being worn over the skirts with a belt, and then it can sometimes be tucked over top of the head. There's a lot of really good Victorian illustrations of this, um, improperly in, in linking it to the 18th century. Uh, but by the 18th century, you find that the description of the heiress had has changed. Um, so they're saying that the plaid is the undress of the ladies to a genteel woman who adjusts it with good air. It's a becoming veil. Um, so look at the image up at the top right of your screen um, of a woman in Scotland from in Highland Scotland from the 1720s. Um, so again, it's made of silk or fine worsted. It's checkered with very lively colors. It's two breadths wide and maybe three yards in length. So it's about the same side as a plaid that a man is wearing. It's broad over the head and may hide or discover the face according to the wearer's fancy or occasion. It reaches the waist behind. Uh, one corner falls as low as the ankle on one side and the other part full in folds hangs down from the opposite arm. So it is a wrap um, that you see women wearing. Um, and in fact, you will see uh, there are many other illustrations of women wearing the er Arised um, in France during uh, with many of the Scottish mercenaries that fought over there during the 1740s. The other two things that are distinct to Scottish women um, happen to be the kirsch or the kirch um, and the, the fillet or the fillet. Um, these are head coverings. The kerch is worn by a married woman, um, and I will again go up to, oops, sorry about that, hit the wrong button, uh, is worn primarily by married woman, women, and you can see one right here, it's a head covering, it's basically, a, it's oversimplified, it's a, it's a handkerchief that's wrapped around the head and then is fastened under the chin uh, by a small brooch. Um, and then you have the fillet, which is worn by unmarried women, which kind of is kind of like a headband that has some sort of adornment on the top. What's interesting about Highland women um, is a lot of times they're depicted of having their hair down um, and uncovered. They're wearing this head covering instead of um, a cap and some sort of hat or other thing over top of it. So they do see their, their hair down. It's not piled on top of their head and it's worn almost in modern ponytail. So these two young ladies here are wearing the fillet. Uh, this, woman here is wearing the kerch, and you have an set in this painting as well. Um, on the right, uh, this isn't something specific, but you do find women are wearing uh, plaid gowns. This is Flora MacDonald. It's an, uh, the artist is unknown. It's believed from, to be from 1750. So again, during that time of the Dress Act, um, women could wear plaid without any repercussions. Um, so she is wearing that, high, that uh, plaid gown, and she is famous because she was the person who transported Charles Edward Stewart to the island of Skye. He was disguised as her handmaid, um, so that way he could escape um, from England and go over to France. Uh, this is a beautiful 
original uh, played gown. Uh, it's called, commonly called the Isabella Fraser McTavish gown. Uh, it's from about 1785, but it's had quite a few ad adjustments that have been made to it over the years. Um, it is of, the, of a front closure uh, with English pleating in the back. Um, what's really interesting about it is if you, if, if during the deconstruction and everything on it, there you can see where there have been errors made. Apparently, the original wearer um, they cut it a bit too small for the woman who who um, for Isabella, um, because underneath of the cuffs um, on the sleeves, there's a gusset in there to open it up a little bit. Um, so they put the cuffs on there to hide that mistake that they made. Um, the ladies at American Duchess, I believe in 2019, um, they did a reconstruction of this gown in, re in real time, draping it to the person. Um, they had the plaid custom made and they reconstructed it um, as it were. So they got to work with the original. Um, it's been worn multiple times since 1785. It is actually a family wedding dress, which is pretty cool. I believe the last time it was worn was the 1970s. Uh, but they did a reconstruction of it. If you're interested in this gown, take a look at the documentary. It's up on YouTube. It's free. Uh, we have another lady in a in a plaid gown in this painting. Uh, this is a painting on the wall of Lovestein Castle in Holland. Um, it's thought to be of Jacobite refugees holding a dance. So you can see uh, the man there. He's wearing the multiple of the men are wearing kilts. Um, looks like the man on the right may be wearing trues. You really can't tell. Uh, but the woman, you can very faintly make out the lines, but she is wearing a red plaid gown. So Scotland during the Dress Act, we just talked about this terrible act of, you know, it's very restrictive and everything like that. Um, you know, were they actually doing that? Maybe. Um, on the left here, we have a warrant against John McKay uh, for wearing of Highland clothes from October of 1785. It's calling for his arrest because he's wearing Highland clothes. Um, there's another case that we know of uh, where a young man drowned in a lake because he was going to be arrested for wearing Highland clothes. He tried to get away and he didn't make it. He's ended up drowning in the lake. However, if you look on the right, this James Erskine, who this letter is from to Colin Campbell, James Erskine was a sheriff in Scotland, and he's writing to one of his uh, deputies telling him about the Dress Act and what they're supposed to do. Um, and he has some very interesting things to say. So first of all, they're, they're saying the act prohibiting the use of plaid and filibeg should be proclaimed at the church doors in Ayrs. Ayrs, by the way, is the 18th century term for the Scots language. Um, you may take all the opportunities you can of letting it be known that tartan may still be worn in cloaks, waistcoats, breeches, and trues, but that if they use loose plaids, they may be of tartan, but either of all of one color or striped with other colors than formerly used. Okay, hold on. So if we remember from the Dress Act, they say they can't wear tartan in cloaks can't wear trues at all specifically says that um and then if they have loose plaids great kilt uh, they may be of tartan but either of one color or striped with other colors than formerly used okay so don't wear stuff you were wearing before interesting but he's still saying like hey we're we're, we're gonna allow the wearing of plaids very very strange there so there's quite a few things that they're not going to enforce that he's already said um, and you can wear tartan in all sorts of stuff. He says you can wear tartan in waistcoats, you can wear it in, in breeches, and you can wear it in cloaks. Uh, but if I, so look, let's go a little bit further. Um, but if they have a mind to use their old plaids, I don't see, but they make them into the shape of a cloak. So wear them in that way, which a button or tied about the neck, if long enough, may be taken up at one side and thrown over the other shoulder, by which it will answer most of the purposes of the loose four, four plaids. So, you can wear it and just throw it over your shoulder kind of as a cloak. And if they could come to the way of wearing it wide like trousers, like sailors breeches, it would be all the conveniences of the kilt and fill a bag for walking and climbing the hills. So sailors breeches, they're just saying kind of, they're just kind of these large like balloon elephant leg type things that you wear over your clothing uh, to make sure that they don't get dirty, but you can wear them like that. There's actually a couple of reports, I haven't found any first person ones, um, that talk about men wearing filibags, but then stitching a running stitch between the legs. So that way, if someone checks, they can say, oh, no, they're just, they're just, they're just sailor slops. They're just trousers. See, there's a line in between. Um, there's a seam here. It's not a, it's not a filibag. So here's some images from Scotland during the time of the Dress Act. And you'll notice on the picture on the left, we have this man right here wearing a plate. 
He's, you can see it right there. And he's right next to a soldier. Shouldn't that man, shouldn't the soldier be arresting him? Um, now, you can wear plaid if you are in the king's service. That's one of the ways you can get around it. If you are a soldier in a Highland regiment, you can wear all of the arms and the accoutrements of, of a Highlander. But you would think he would be enforcing it. Uh, coming over to the right, this is what I'm talking about with the sailor slops in plaid. So this is actually a sailor. And thanks to Kyle Dalton of the uh, Civil War Medical Museum, he, he pointed this out to me through his blog, British Tars. Uh, but this Scottish sailor here is wearing a pair of slops that are in plaid. Um, you can see that there appears to be some sort of uh, some sort of seam sewn in the middle, and you can see his breeches underneath of it. So very interesting there. Again, we have, this is 1751 on the left, outside of Edinburgh, and you can see several men are wearing plaid. They're wearing it both uh, in, in the belted plaid, um, and they also have it draped over their shoulder, like our sheriff friend said in his letter. Uh, but you see it all over the place in 1751. And, and look over on the right. Here's uh, a young King George III. He's wearing a plaid coat. You know, how what are we going to do with him? Uh, now that being said, he is wearing the uniform of the Royal Archers, and that's what that plaid is from. Uh, this is uh, some poor a poorer family um, in in Scotland in 1772. Um, you can see most of the women here are wearing plaid. You see a plaid gown, uh, several plaid wraps. Um, you can also see plaid hanging throughout the cottage on the inside. Um, so, I mean, it's all over the place. And then in 1773, uh, Samuel Johnson takes a journey to the Western Islands of Scotland. He writes, he writes a, a travel log about it. And Sam Johnson says that in the island, the plaid is very rarely worn. Uh, the law by which the Highlanders have been obliged to change their forms of dress has, in all places we have visited, been universally obeyed. I have seen only one gentleman completely clothed in the ancient habit, and by him it was only worn occasionally and wantonly. So he's doing it only every now and again, and he's, he knows what he's doing is wrong. The filibeg, so again, that's that small fitted kilt, um, or lower garment is still very common, and the bonnet almost universal. So that's that hat again. Um, their attire is such as produces a sufficient degree the effect intended by the law of abolishing and, and dissimilitude of the appearance between highlanders and the other inhabitants of britain so he's saying that hey it's i really don't notice a difference there's everyone they're doing the filibeg but for the most part they kind of look like the rest of us so again 1780 towards the end of the dress act it is repealed in 1782 um, these famous paintings by david allen you see uh men in trues uh the dancing guy in the middle with his fantastic trues right here. Uh, you see kilts all over the place, played. There we go. Here's a soldier who should be arresting everyone. Uh, here's another played. There's the lady in the Arised. Um, and then there's this fantastic guy right here. Uh, the famous the famous Scottish fiddler, Neil Gal, who is known for wearing his played uh, breeches with, with hose. It's fantastic. Love it. So again, here we go. You should recognize this picture was on the event. More filibags, more plaids, paratrues all over the place. And a soldier just being sloth and not arresting all these people for breaking the law. Um, so, you know, I've talked about this. We've got the Highland wear. We've got a lot of, so what is what does an actual typical 18th century Scout look like? And to paraphrase Sam Johnson, they don't look too much different. Um, they're mostly described as wearing typical English attire. They're wearing breeches. They're wearing um, west. They're wearing uh, jackets. They're wearing coats. They're wearing great coats. They're wearing all the things that you see in English. There's there's a few differences, uh, but for the most part, Scottish. There, there's a good deal of Scottish assimilation under the Acts of Union. Um, by 1745, by 1747, it had almost been in place for it had been in place for almost for 40 years. Um, by this point in time, Glasgow is a major trade part port of, of the United of the United Kingdom. Um, there's a lot of movers and shakers in society as well who are Scots. You have John Stuart, the third Earl of Butte, who was the prime minister for a time. You have Alan Ramsay, the painter. You have Alan Ramsay, the poet. You've got James Boswell. You have David Hume, Adam Smith, Robert Burns, David Allison, and Alison Cockburn, who was a, you might not have heard her name, but she was a, a poet, a, a wittist, um, and she also ran a very good social circle that had a lot of influential artists and writers in Scotland. 
Um, so she was a veritable who's who living in Edinburgh. Um, and the other thing is, like we talked about wearing the plaid in Scottish units, uh, but you find that about a third of Scots, uh, sorry, a third of non-Highland units are filled with Scots. So they're all over the place. They're not just joining Scottish military units, they're joining regular battalion in, uh, military units. So they're all over the place. They're very assim assimilated. However, there still are some subtleties and differences in their, in their wear. Things that you see quite frequently is you find that they're not wearing uh, great coats quite as much. They, they still do wear cloaks and they still do wear play, plaids as, as shawls as cloaks. You've got heiresses. You've got the men wearing the blue bonnets. Um, and a lot of times this isn't something that's particularly Scottish, but it does show up quite frequently in images. You see a lot more men who are Scottish have shoes with ties instead of buckles. So looking at some images, these are right after uh, the Battle of Culloden, and you notice that most of the people in this image, um, you wouldn't be able to pick out of a crowd in England if you were looking at some of these. These were pa uh, painted by Paul Sandby. Uh, you see the women, for the most part, they're wearing erisids. Um, Some of them are not, but a lot of the men, with the exception of a few, they look like they could be out of the streets of London. Just to kind of give you some more examples, uh, up, in the, up in the left, uh, this is a Scottish lead factory. It's painted by David Allen. Um, you have the one man who's wearing some sort of plaid, uh, plaid cloak over top of his uh, over top of his clothes, uh, but for the most part, everyone else you couldn't tell. There's one. The foreman in the back has a bonnet on, but for the most part, they're wearing cocked hats. They're wearing round hats. They look exactly like other Englishmen. Um, these ads that you see here on the page, these are for people that are put uh, that are pointed out as Highlanders, as Scots. One of them can't even speak English. But he's wearing breeches, a waistcoat, and a coat. He looks nothing like you would expect someone who is is Scottish and and, and stereotypical. So, not your your kilted Highlander like you would see in some Victorian uh, penny romance. They look exactly like everyone else. So, moving on to the the talk of this Scottish goods in Pennsylvania. Um, first thing we're going to look at is merchant advertisements. So, uh, merchant advertisements, what, hold on, I'm trying to clear all drawing. There we go. Um, merchant advertisements. These are just a few of the ones I pulled, but these are some of the more interesting ones. Uh, the first one up at the top is, mentions a, a yard wide scotch check, scotch handkerchiefs. And the other cool thing that is mentioned in this ad is, right down here played and leather breeches so it indicates that these are ready-made breeches in played not further defined so it could be solid color it could be of tartan but there are ready-made breeches that are being sent over from scotland for wear um, we have this one right down here we have spear and stewart they mentioned scots played or tartan talking about saying scots played or tartan same type of thing um, they're also talking about blue bonnets, Kilbardock caps, which is another type of bonnet uh, closely related to the modern um, Balmoral bonnet. Um, and there's Highland Garters, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. James McGruger. This one is very interesting because he talks about, let me find it. He says he has plating, uh, but then he also talks a little bit later about having... Uh, but he also talks about having um, tartan in there as well. So he's he lists them separately and he lists them apart from each other, which means that, oh, here he is, Buckram, tartans and camblets. And then later he talks about plating. So he's mentioning these two fabrics as two separate things. So more than likely he has tartan, which, which was what we think of, that checked fabric. But he's also talking about plating as a fabric by itself. So that may be that solid color to that striped material that we're talking about. So there is separation that we that is noted in this advertisement. We also look over here, Glasgow and Wilson. He's mentioning tartan plaids. James Stewart, looking at scotch plaid again. So it's probably that, that tartan. Um, he's talking about all sorts of different stuff. So the, again, just a sampling of what we're looking at. Um, now we get, a, we have a rare instance here of this guy, Matthew Hopkins, who is a Scottish merchant. He lives in Maryland in Frederick County. Um, his home resided around what is now Georgetown, but he had a shop in Frederick, Maryland, um, and he had quite a few other places out there. 
very vast um, merchant, this, this man. He owned a lot of land all over the place. So he's born in Scotland in 1711. Um, he comes to Maryland in 1745, and he dies in Frederick County in 1751. And in his inventory, it lists all of the stuff that he has. And among them, we see 109 yards of narrow plating. That's a lot. 17 and a half yards of narrow plating in another entry. Uh, but then we also find that he has 34 pair of plating hose. Um, that may just be regular regular stockings. It may not be anything Highland. It, it, this, this wording could have multiple meanings. But he also has eight yards of narrow striped tartan plate and 23 and a half yards of broad striped tartan plate. So he has at least 30 yards of tartan in his inventory. So this stuff, this narrow plating, maybe that solid colored fabric, it may be, oh, it may be striped. Oh, sorry, he does have striped tartan. I forgot that he had that as well. So he has eight yards of striped, uh, sorry, no, I apologize. Wrong, wrong thing, reading the wrong thing, thinking of another inventory. Um, so he does have tartan plate. That's the thing I'm getting at is he has two different types of stuff on his inventory and he has quite a significant amount of it. Private owned items. These are a bit harder to find. Um, if anyone in this has ever been an ex executor of a will, which I have, I can tell you the, the thing you're focused on the most is just getting all the stuff logged and being done with it. So unfortunately, in inventories, we don't find that there is a ton of detail on probate records. Most of the time, you find that the appraisers listing all of the person's clothes simply as wearing apparel with no further description. So we have really no idea what's in there. You'll see some items listed out, but for the most part, it just comes as X amount of dollars wearing apparel. It's not very descriptive. But every now and again, you come across something cool like this one here, uh, where this probate inventory of James Carrick happens to have two remnants of tartan. I don't know how big they are. I don't know what they look like. Uh, they could be enough for an article of clothing. I don't know what his wearing apparel includes. Maybe the remnants of tartan are left over from the completely tartan suit that he had made. I don't know, but what I do know is that he has two remnants of tartan. So as I said, these are harder to find. I'm still looking for these in Pennsylvania. I'm still looking for these in Maryland, but they do show up every now and again. So we're looking at uh, merchant advertisements. What do they mention? They mention plate, they mention plating. Tartan plate, Scots plate, super fine Scots plate, silk, worsted, they all sorts of different stuff. What else is interesting is that they mention Scots, Scots plate suitable for little boys' short clothes or gentlemen's morning gowns. So if you remember that wrapping gown I showed earlier from the Colonial Williamsburg collection, that's what they're talking about. And what's really interesting is they also talk about best Scotch plates for Highland dress. So they're specifically mentioning that it is meant for Highland dress, which is pretty cool. Uh, we know that that is probably not those solid colored white and blue plaids that you find in a lot of enslaved clothing. They're also mentioning plaid breeches, blue bonnets and Kilmarnock caps, Kilmarnock bonnets, Highland garter, uh, garter scotch hose, plating hose, all sorts of different stuff. So again, all of these other things that, th that we're mentioning in terms of Highland dress, uh, that is in the context of the plaid. So there may be other merchant advertisements that are talking about those individually, but this is what is showing up inside of searches with played. So you have some connotation in advertising of a Scottish identity with the stuff that is coming in. So if you're looking at it, uh, to date, I found 16 separate merchant advertisements. Uh, more show up, but I found 16 so far. Um, and the, so they also, you know, when I say 16 separate, I don't mean duplicates. So like a Stuart will put out one and he'll run it for two months. I only count that as one. So I found 16 separate throughout the period. They show up from 1747 through 1777. They stop a little bit after 1770. You know, there might be a reason for that. There was a war going on. Uh, most of the imports are coming from Scotland, Glasgow, and London. That's where they're listed from. A lot of the merchant names are Scottish. Um, and some advertise, advertisements are, are aimed at that Scottish or that Highland association. And the other cool thing is that the goods are varying. They include silk and superfine materials. So if you're just looking at the metrics, 16. There are 15 of those ads that mention played specifically. One of them doesn't. It says Scotch check. So it's the same thing, but it doesn't specifically say the word played. Of those 16 ads, 10 of them say tartan. 
that's a lot. Um, other indications, they are either specifying the pattern as crossbarred or check. So again, indicating that it's probably what we, the tartan. Um, and then there are two of them that distinctly list played and tartan as separate things, showing that they're two separate items in the inventory. Four of them have ads with other Scottish goods included. Five of them mention fine goods. One of them mentions Highland dress and two of them specifically look at dressing gowns. So as I say, we'll continue, but that's where we're at so far with merchant advertisements. Uh, runaways and deserters. So these are advertisements that when someone who um, is enslaved, has an indenture, um, we'll, we'll find some more stuff in here because there's a couple ads as well. But when someone, they will put out an advertisement describing the individual. And a lot of times it describes what they're wearing or what they, what they took with them. Um, so you want to list things that stick out sometimes. And unfortunately, um, sometimes they're not always the nicest to the people that ran away. Uh, but we did, again, this is just a segment of them. This isn't all of the things that I've found to date. Uh, but these are some of the more interesting ones. The first one in the top left um, is very interesting. So it's not about the runaway herself because eloped. So this is a woman who ran away from her husband to go elope with someone else. Elizabeth Stewart. Um, who eloped from her husband, John Smith. And she, oh, sorry, she eloped with a man named John Smith who had on when he went away a Highland plaid jacket, a blue bonnet with a, bl with a blemish in one of his eyes. And this is the craziest part. This is why it's interesting. He has the mark of a musket ball through both of his jaw bones, which probably means that at some point in time, he was shot through the face and the bullet went in through one side and out on the other. That's interesting. But what else is interesting is that he's wearing a Highland plaid jacket and a blue bonnet. So Scottish attire that we've seen earlier in some of the images of people in Scotland. Uh, we also have deserted from John Nice's company. This is from the American Revolution in 1776. A deserter who is described as wearing plaid trousers. It's not further defined, so it may be solid, it may be striped, or it may be that tartan pattern that we're looking at, but it doesn't actually say. Uh, up here in the in the right, we have um, William Wharton, who is had on when he went away a plain linsey jacket and breeches, an under jacket of Scotch plating. So an under jacket is something you would wear underneath um, of your waistcoat to keep you warm, but it's saying that it's of Scotch plating, so it's of that pattern once again. Um, a lot of times in under jackets, they're in just twilled patterns or uh, worsted wool that we would call stuff, so it's interesting that it has the pattern on there. Um, and we have right here, uh, down at the bottom, um, two Scots, one of them, one's a Scots Highland man. And the first one, Daniel McCraw is, he's described just as anyone else. Nothing really, nothing really, uh, great about his appearance. He would, you could pass for an Englishman, uh, but you also have the Scotch Highland boy, John Mitchell, who was described when he went away, trousers and breeches was strapped to the breeches, a tartan jacket, um, without sleeves. So that would actually be a waistcoat. Um, that's what they're talking about there. And it's lined with green shalloon. He has a silk handkerchief, a felt hat, and he carried with him two old linen jackets, one flowered and one white shirt. So he's wearing a, a plaid, a, a tartan under a tartan waistcoat. Um, this image that you see right here, if you remember the picture earlier um, of the lead of the lead refinery that I showed, uh, this showed up in the back uh, while I was doing this research. I was look also looking at wheelbarrows, and I found this by accident. Um, I just, oh, that's a cool wheelbarrow. So I zoomed in on it and I noticed this guy right here. I looked at his clothes and I noticed that it appears to be green and there appear to be some blue stripes that go vertically and also horizontally. And it definitely looks like this man who's hidden in the background of, of an image of smelting the orf by David Allen. He could very well be wearing a plaid coat and played breeches. I'm not really sure what's going on with his waistcoat underneath, because uh, again, we're zooming in something that's very small, uh, but here's an image of someone who is possibly wearing a, a, a tartan coat and breeches, something like we might see one of these runaways wearing. So moving on to some more, we see up at the top left, uh, a runaway, an, an enslaved runaway uh, named Tony, who is described as wearing a plaid jacket and breeches. Um, and he also had on an iron collar about his neck. 
Um, so earlier, what I was saying, played in America, a lot of times are those solid colors. They tend to show up in blue. They tend to show up in white. This is more than likely what this type of plate is talking about. Um, it's not further defined, uh, but based on context and what we know of the textile in, in the colonies, that is more than likely what he's wearing. So to give you an idea of what that looks like, we have this painting uh, by John Rose from 1785 called The Old Plantation. Um, some of these enslaved persons very well may be wearing that blue or white plate um, that was often worn uh, by enslaved persons. Uh, we also have Luce, who is described as wearing, uh, where is it down here? She carried with her a variety of clothes consisting of Lindsay, some homespun petticoats and short gowns and a tartan gown. So she's described as wearing a tartan gown. And if you thought one tartan gown was great, um, there is actually another one in here. Uh, Sue, about 45 years of age. Very artful, Lando mm -hmm. covers some of her teeth. She is missing some of her teeth, which you discover when she laughs. Variety of clothes among them are a tartan, a white linen, and a calico gown. So again, a tartan gown. So we have two tartan gowns here worn by runaway enslaved women. Um, we also have Anne Kaltner, or uh, up here. She's not a runaway, but she is described as leaving a child with someone else that she went into their house. Um, and she is described as wearing a plaid petticoat, not further defined. So it may be solid. It may be striped. Um, okay. Uh, now these three are particularly interesting. I save these, I save the best for last uh, because in the top left, we have some of the most interesting one. We have a five-year-old boy named John who, when he ran away, is wear is described as wearing a Scotch plaid kilt. It doesn't get any more Highland than that. Um, five-year-old boy. So hey, it's good for Highland clothes for small boys. Here's someone actually wearing it. Um, down here from 1760, we have an Irishman, um, a corporal who is at Fort Pitt. Uh, by the name of Richard Warren. And when he ran away, he, uh, when he deserted, he had on a blue regimental clothes. So he's wearing a blue regimental coat of the provincial troops. And he also was wearing a Highland plaid kilt. And this is my favorite part, which makes him remarkable when he, when he wears it. I would think so. We don't see that many other kilts showing up. So I would think that a guy wearing a military coat and a kilt would definitely stick out. Uh, but luckily for him, he also happens to have a pair of blue cloth breeches. So hopefully he'll change those. That way he blends in a little bit more. Um, and then here from 1765, we have Daniel McDonald, who is a Highland man about 25 years of age. And when he runs away, he is described um, as having a Highland shroud tied with a blue ferret. So he is more than likely wearing something like you see this lowland Scott right here. Um, with the plaid wrapped around him and a ferret is just a, a tie. It could be silk more than likely. It could also be worsted, but that's to tie it in place around him. So we see some very distinctive Highland clothes that are showing up um, in Pennsylvania. Not as many. There, I've only found three so far, but they do show up and I got very excited by all of these. Um, and then what else is really cool? This is awesome. So uh, if you're familiar with Johann Conrad Gilbert or just Conrad Gilbert, he was a German immigrant who came over and lived in Berks County, Pennsylvania. Um, you're probably familiar with his work, even if you don't know his name, because he was the first person to draw uh, the Easter Bunny with eggs. Um, to those two paintings are down at Cloning Williamsburg in their art collection. But he also drew this paint, this picture that you see on the left um, of a man from Berks County, and it is described as this man is wearing played breeches. Um, and if you look at the pattern on there, it does show some irregular patterning, which is more typical of played as opposed to just straight check. Uh, but you do have this painting that he draw of a Berks County, a Pennsylvania man in the last part of the 18th century wearing played. So we have an actual image of someone doing it, which is very cool. So me, being the person that I am, I decided to recreate it. So you see my best attempt at doing this painting um, on the right with a different color scheme. I think I did okay. So you're looking at the data of what people are wearing. Uh, we see play, played Highland coats, tartan coats, played waistcoats, tartan under waistcoats, all sorts of different stuff. Two examples of kilts, one example of a Highland shroud. We see tartan gowns. Uh, we see linings of men and women's clothing. Some of it is just described as played, so it may be something that's more like 
common worsted linings like a shalloon or a serge, but we also see a couple of them that are actually said as scotch played lining. Um, so they, they are described as having that, that connotation of having that pattern on them. We also see played stockings, which again, I, I said may have some, may just be you know, regular stockings depending on where they are because there's multiple definitions for that. And we also see petticoats um, and we see blue bonnets showing up yet again. The wearers are Scottish, English, Irish, they're enslaved persons and they're Welsh. So, so to date so far, and again, in the context of looking at played, so the other things that show up like blue bonnets, um, those are purely secondary to the search. Runaways wearing played, I found 23 so far. 19 of them say the word plate. Eight of them specify either tartan or of a tartan pattern. So that's either scotch plate or they specifically say tartan. Ads that are mentioning some sort of Highland wear is three. Um, that's my shroud and, and my, my kilts. Uh, of those ads, not all of their ethnicity is mentioned, uh, but uh, by far Scottish or Highlander shows up five of them. Um, enslaved wearers, five of them show up as well. Uh, Irish shows up next as three. There's three people who are, who are described as English, and there's one person who's described as Welsh. No one shows up as German. Um, haven't even found a German-sounding name. Um, so of the people of Pennsylvania, pretty much everyone was wearing, wearing uh, some sort of plate or tartan, it looks like, except for the Germans. So overall findings is that we do have a significant amount of Scottish material and items coming in, into Pennsylvania during the time period. Um, and they, they tend to have some sort of linkage to Scotland, Scotland either by name, so maybe heritage. Um, and they often specifically advertise the collection, the, the connection, which I think is kind of interesting, talking about Highland wear, about Highland things. Um, and, you know, naming it as Scottish, not just because because um, it's, it's where it came from. Uh, there are there are some ready-made Scottish clothing items from those plaid breeches to those caps that are coming and bonnets that are coming into the uh, into the colony. Um, frequently, the frequency of plaid and tartan clothing is fairly consistent. There may, may not be a ton of it that we, that we see compared to other things, uh, but it is fairly consistent. It doesn't really seem to have lulls or pickups. It just kind of happens all throughout. And the other cool thing that's interesting is that the appearance of Scots in Pennsylvania is fairly consistent with those in Scotland. They do tend to wear what we would consider English attire for the most part, uh, but the peculiarities tend to be the, the short jackets or the tartan jackets that show up every now and again, and the wearing of bonnets on the heads. Um, however, we are lacking some items that we talked about earlier in Highland wear. I have not found any instances of an erised. That may be because people don't know what it is, or maybe women who are running away or, desert, or deserting or something like that, they're not wearing them, um, or they're being mistaken as a blanket. As I said, it's three yards long by about 60 inches wide. That just looks like a really extra long light blanket. They might not know what it is. So why would you describe something as an erised if a German or a Welsh or an Irish person is not going to know what that term means? Also, if you're inventorying someone's probate, uh, it might just look like a blanket. They might not know what it is when they say that. Uh, you also don't see the, the ladies' uh, headwear, the curse of the fillet. Um, the other thing that I found was very interesting is that plaid and highland clothes are worn by many groups. It's not just the Scots that are wearing it. There, other people are described as wearing tartan. You have those two uh, enslaved women who are described as wearing tartan gowns. You have the Irishman who is wearing a kilt. Um, so they show up not exclusively to Scots. Um, and it's being played in tartan. They're being used as textiles in pretty much all the items of clothing that you see that people are wearing. It shows up all over the place. So it doesn't have like the significance that you would see as just wearing a plaid. They're, 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 they're out there anyway. But the biggest thing to remember is there's still a lot of unknowns because things are simply described as played uh, with no further description of is it striped? Is it solid? Is it this color? Is it that color? Does it have the check bar? There's a lot of things we don't know. Um, you know, if we could go back in time, we'd want them to give a little bit more description. Uh, but unfortunately, we still have a lot of unknowns, um, and we'll continue to look at this. But what we do know is that it is there. Um, so with that, I think that is my last slide, and we'll go to questions. And, so and before we do, um, I before we go to Q&A, first off, thank you for me, Sean, and thank you for the Conic Dig Institute. I'm going to try something interesting. I'm going to try and make this feel like there is everyone together. I'm going to unmute everyone. You'll get a response. You'll get a request to unmute. Please unmute yourself and then give Sean a round of applause as you feel fit. 
And don't worry, I can mute you again afterwards. <laughs> um, bravo, yes, the bravo. And then I'm going to mute you all again. And there we go. We should all be muted. And I, I probably even muted Sean as well. Um, so, yeah. You did. I did. I unmuted you. You have that power. Uh, so, yeah, that was a wonderful pres presentation. And um, although we did overrun a little bit, we still have 54 people viewing. And so I'm sure people have some questions that uh, they would like answered. Um, so if you do have a question, now is the time to post it. I've had a few people have put some throughout. So I'll just kind of uh, go through them as I can backlog them. Uh, one of them, Sean, was one I think you can definitely do. Uh, it's from Nancy Walker. Uh, Nancy asked, uh, is there a different cost what was for these fabrics uh was it cheaper or more expensive than say broadcloth or kind of just traditional twill fabric and if that if it is more expensive why why would you pay why would you buy it if it's going to cost you more of your pool for example <laughs> well so there i mean with all cloth uh there there are variations in price um i mean one, one thing i'll 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 find it very interesting is when you look at uh records of uh, when, no, sorry, kiddo. Um, when you look at <laughs> records of uh, Charles Wilson Peel, I'll give this a good example. He, he actually lists cloth um, of broadcloth and he, he finds that there are, there's pr plain broadcloth that costs more than super fine, um, which so super fine you would think is, is better, but it really it depends on who's making it, where it's coming from, what the actual quality of it is. Um, so with these plaids, you'll find that there are different varieties and we've already, you know, I touched on that a little bit is that you find fine plating. Um, you have regular plating and some of the, the, the runaways and deserters are described as wearing coarse plating. So coarse will cost less. You'll have your regular plating, which will kind of be more than likely in the middle. Um, and then you'll have the fine or the super fine stuff uh, that's going to cost a bit more. Uh, why would you go for something that, you know, cost more? Well, it's, it's what money you have on hand. Uh, you're going to use this cloth as, as equitably as you possibly can. Um, and if all you can afford is coarse cloth, um, or if you're going to wear it for a purpose that, you know, you don't, you're going to be working it or something like that, that's, that's what you're going to, you're going to get. You can get what you afford. Um, I, I guess that's the, the long-winded well, version of the long-winded answer that I want to give that'll take an hour and we'll just go into it. And, and, and definitely from, uh, from making some recently, uh, it definitely has its detriments because of all that, the way we've the wefts, it doesn't. It's not the easiest cloth to work with. No, it's not. And a lot of it goes into the dye as well. Um, you know, we know that dyes are, dyes are more expensive, um, natural dyes. Um, you know, you can see things that are brighter and red always cost more because you're dealing with things like cochineal for the best to get that scarlet um, matter for the less. And then green and more earth tone dyes uh, definitely don't cost as, as much to do. So um, there's many varying factors. We're getting a lot of people, uh, just first of all, just complimenting the lecture in itself. Um, a couple of people, Karen Slagle's asking, she's you like to talk about Ar Arisades? Is anyone selling material appropriate to them? Uh, Karen, because uh, Sean and I have contact <laughs> with you, uh, we will talk textiles uh, privately. Uh, Sean has actually been looking at a lot of overseas importations for some of his personal projects, which some sometimes you have to go there. Uh, earlier in the lecture, uh, Sue Ellen Berkey asked, um, played uh, Highland versus Lowland. Um, we talked a little bit about Edinburgh just being as English as the English, um, but are Lowlanders wearing as much played or? So good question. Um, I mean, you definitely see a lot more assimilation in, in Lowland, uh, in, you know, in Lowland Scots. There definitely is played that does show up that is specifically linked uh, to Lowland Scots. Uh, by the way, for anyone who's really interested in the history of tartan and the history of plaids, um, I'll plug this uh, this fantastic historian by the name of Peter McDonald, who studies all of this. He looks at a lot of original art, artifacts. He has a website. He does research on Facebook and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, but a lot of those images I shared from David Allen, where you have the men in the Highland shrouds, most of them are depicting uh, Lowland Scots. So when they are wearing it, what you see in imagery is that they're wearing more of the plaid draped across themselves. Um, in the shroud that may or may not be tied in any sort of way. That is how they're typically depicted if they're wearing it. You don't see as many images of them um, wearing uh, plaids uh, that are belted or, or filler bags. Um, Chuck Crepley asked from uh, Facebook, we do have 11 people on Facebook, 
Uh, can you address the definition of flavorless versus tartan? I'm assuming, Chuck, you probably joined a little bit after the first slide. Um, it was actually one of the first things. It is the one of those common questions played? And it, it's like a very, it. it's a very contra. I wouldn't say controversial, but it's there's there's still a lot of debate on it in North America. It seems a lot more cut and dry when you're dealing with textiles in Scotland and in England. But knowing that there are textiles that are described as being striped or being solid blue, that their uh, plaids are being worn by enslaved persons and bought for to clothe them specifically, it ends a little bit, of, it ends up muddying the waters a bit in North America. So it's one of those things that we're still kind of coming up with a working definition of it in order to figure out the context of it. Now, for everyone who registered, everyone who should be on this Zoom, I should have your email. Uh, Sean, first off, are you happy sharing a presentation with me to email to the attendees? Uh, um, let me do a little bit of uh, stuff back, with it. Back end cleanup. Back. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, because we'll definitely get ads out people in the next uh, week or so. Um, of course, this will be on YouTube. Um, okay. From Andrew Newman, Sean, do you think Scottish textile industry has something to do with the lack that like basical enforcement and continue to being worn of the acts of prescription important export industry? Andrew, could you have asked? Uh, <laughs> similar... <laughs> I think Sean got the gist. Um, so. There's, uh, you know, getting into not, <laughs> I was looking more at textiles as opposed to enforcement of British laws in the 1740s. Um, but when you look into the Dress Act, they, one of the things that does show up that you can look at and shows up pretty quickly is that they were originally going to enforce it in 1747, and then it gets pushed back a year. And then it gets, oh, well, we'll push back the enforcement of just this part and that part. So part of it seems to do with logistical aspects of enforcing it. Um, you know, also remember that policing of this in the 18th century was not like it is to, you don't have a constabulary or things like that. Those really don't show up um, in metropolitan areas until the, the, the early 19th century. So really, how are you going to enforce it? You're going to have to have people who are, you know, militias or the sheriff going out and finding this. I think that has part of the reason to do with it. But also, it's like, what, what what's what's really going to be the point of it there's already a lot of assimilation to it um and yeah they're they're producing you have people like uh wilson and sons of bannockburn uh, uh bannockburn who's who they're producing played they're doing it for the military they're looking at it as well so it may have something to do with that it's not really going to slow it down because they can still export it to other places uh but i think there's a number of things that are leading to the lack of enforcement of the dress act i think part of it is just going out and finding the people you don't have the logistics to do it um, and then you're going to imprison someone for six months for wearing plaid. That's a little ridiculous. Um, I think we'll end on this last question uh, from Liz Jones. Um, when did plaid become a designation for pattern, not fabric? And we discussed this in the dress rehearsal, Sean, about the, the American mistake. Yeah, it's it's definitely an American. It's an American thing is that we see it and it just switched at some point in time. I would I would love to be able to say on this date. Uh, but I don't think we can do that. But we, we think of it in America as a pattern as opposed to tartan the fabric. So it's just kind of, it's changed in our lexicon, whereas opposed in 18th century uh, British or British colonies, it's completely different. Um, and there, there are those changes. And it leads to a lot of confusion for us trying to um, trying to study it. And, even, and don't, even don't make... Talk about it. <laughs> yes. And, and let's not be, let's not, you know, be exclusive to this being about plate and tartan. Um, this exists with pretty much all textiles in the 18th century because there you end up with terms that are synonymous with each other or um, things that are oh it's oh it's this thing well that could mean five things you know it, oh it's cotton does that mean it's actually made out of cotton or does that mean that it's linen um, <laughs> there's there's a lot of books on fabric history okay Liz I will I I saw that one it popped I popped up. Um, if you want to learn about fabrics and textiles in the 18th century, the best book you can get, it's out of print. It's called Textiles in America um, from 1650 to, I believe, 1850. It's by uh, Montgomery is the author's name. You can do a quick Google search on it. I mentioned it at the, at the front of it. It talks a whole lot about textiles, but one of the best things is that it has a dictionary of textiles in the back. And so if you come across something like thunder and lightning because there's described a fabric thunder and lightning coat and you wonder what the heck is that it'll tell you what it is uh, thunder and lightning by the way is multicolor, um a multicolor weave so it gives it a, a double to, uh, colored approach which is pretty cool um and with that it's the perfect segue into a plug for the conjured institute 
Uh, I, I was in our library today and our library has 9,000 books in. Uh, an entire shelf is on textiles and their material culture. A number of those fabric books are uh, in that. In the middle library, we have a culture section, which is just on Scotland, Ireland and Wales. Uh, you could get lost in our Scottish section. So if you'd like to see some of these books or let them out, uh, members of the Connacht Dick Institute can withdraw our books uh, as part of their membership. It's a lending library only for members. So sign up now as a member. You can either do it online or you can uh, do it in person. Get your membership card, come check out those books. Um, we will, uh, again, we'll put some of this information out there via email. We'll get it onto YouTube. But I do have a question for everyone. And uh, this is a pretty big one. What made you join today? This was our first virtual lecture. Um, we didn't know what the attention was going to be, and it skyrocketed. So I have a couple of theories. Is it the passion for Scottish heritage, which is huge? Is it because it was free, which is always a plus? Or is it because you just love Zoom lectures that much? So just type Scotland lecture Zoom. Or my husband is a speaker, but that's going to be the minority, hopefully. There should be just one person who did that. Um, and with that same thing as you kind of type in there, Scottish, 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 one plus two. Uh, I like that, Emily, one plus two. Um, yeah, no, so with that, by all means, we are always looking for advice on what people, what our members and what our uh, visitors want to see. So if you have an idea for a future lecture, something you're interested in, uh, if you have a lecture you could do, please let us know uh, and we could do this again because uh, success, emulates itself. So I definitely see us being something that we could do again. We do want to get into the in-person lectures again, because who doesn't like a tray of biscuits and tea? Uh, but in the interim, this Zoom, it proved it worked. Uh, one final thing I'll say is that uh, the Konica Jig Institute is doing a matching campaign right now, a $50,000 matching campaign. And I want to take this opportunity uh, to thank everyone who has donated. We started this just three weeks ago. Uh, one donor offered the matching. And in three weeks, we've raised $14,000. I was not expecting that uh, because our donation levels were 100, 250, 500. So 14,000 in three weeks is wonderful. Uh, we truly anticipate in the next stage, which is going to foundations and businesses, that we are going to meet our 50,000 by June 1st. So if you'd like to support the Conjugate Institute, these presentations, uh, Sean's great stuff, please consider donating any amount. Um, there's more information about on it online, and I will, again, I'll share it to you via email. All right, any final words, Sean, as the presenter? Uh, no, I'm really, I'm, I'm happy for this opportunity. So thank you to you. Thank you to the CI. Um, thank you to Kyle Dalton, if he's there for that great find with the, uh, the, the trousers. Thanks to Andrew Newman as well, because he sent me some stuff. So when I said, you know, research is ongoing, Andrew Newman set me up with that, you know, question just to, I think, just to throw me a curveball. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, Andrew has found quite a good deal of stuff as well. And I have kind of, stalled on sending him what I what I found so that way he wasn't just like you know ruined everything from tonight for him um but yeah thanks to Andrew it was, it was a lot of good stuff thanks to everyone thanks to Jacob Davis who's on here who you know ran through this the other day to make sure we knew what to do with technology and we're not a bunch of Luddites and of course thank you to my wife who is currently uh watching the kiddos while I do this in the other room and uh, contain playing, them <laughs> playing, playing kid and cat duty is wonderful uh, well, we're at an hour and 12 minutes. Um, I'm still wearing my uh, wet sock from this morning. So with that, I'll be there for you. <laughs> if you're interested in learning more, visit our website at cimlg.org. I have all of your emails, so I'm going to email you regardless uh, about some updates. Follow us on Facebook, follow us on YouTube, where else we posted. Come visit the site. We're open Saturdays. Uh, we've got some spare cabbage there. Um, we've got some, we're open Saturdays, this Saturday we'll do some cooking. So yes, have a wonderful evening. Keep sharing your history and cultural heritage and we'll see you again soon. How do you say goodbye in a earth, Sean? Uh, I will tell you, but I'll hit the leave button before. <laughs> well, I'm going to end it anyway.